All right, everyone, it is uh, five o'clock, so we are going to get started. I've been looking through some of your answers in the chat box. It's been really nice to see, uh, seeing what kind of nocturnal animals you might have been seeing. So these are nighttime active animals. It seems like lots of owls and coyotes. I see skunks and bats, mice. That's super cool. It's really nice to see that you all are able to enjoy some of this nighttime activity. So we are going to get started now. I'm going to turn off the chat box just for now. We will be turning it on, um, on and off throughout this webinar today as well. Uh, I want to introduce myself. My name is Lauren McLeod. I am the Southern Region Urban Wildlife Coordinator for the Nevada Department of Wildlife. So I'm based out of the Las Vegas area. Uh, helping out today, we also have Jessica Wolf, and she is the Urban Wildlife Coordinator for the Western Region, so she's up in the Reno area. Uh, I do want to get, uh, before we get started, I want to go over a little bit of the webinar basics for those of you that might be new at webinars or new with Zoom, just to go over some uh, general guidelines and practices for how we're going to do this webinar today. Um, to start, you can see and hear me. Uh, I cannot see and hear you, so if you're in your pajamas, that's fine. I can't see you. Uh, if you do have questions or comments, we do have features on this webinar that allow you to make those comments or ask those questions. So for those of you that have used the chat box already, uh, that's something that you can make use of throughout this webinar. Uh, a note with that, too, you'll notice when you are writing in the chat box, there's a drop-down menu and it asks if you want it to go to panelists or to panelists and attendees. So if you have it set on panelists, it just goes to me and Jess, but if you want to share it with the rest of the group, you can set it to panelists and attendees. Uh, there is a question and answer feature in Zoom as well, and this is something that you can use throughout the webinar if you have any questions that I may not have answered during this program, and that's why Jess is here. So she is going to be on the sidelines answering everyone's questions as I'm doing the presentation so that we can try to answer any inquiries you have the best that we can. And for any questions that aren't answered during the webinar, uh, I will be opening it up to questions at the end and I can answer all of those live as well. So stick around for that too and maybe we can have some fun discussion with it as well. Um, with the Q&A and the chat box, you'll notice at the top of the screen, there's a little bit of a disclaimer. So we want to make sure and remind everyone that this is a PG program. It is for all ages, which means you need to keep behavior appropriate in the Q&A and chat box features. And we will remove you if we see that that behavior is not abided by. And we don't want to do that. So just make sure that we're all being nice in there. Um, and I think that's all in terms of the webinar basics. Uh, you'll notice my video screen. I think you can move around that floating head on your screen if you need to. If it gets in the way of the PowerPoint that I'm presenting, you can minimize it too. I won't be offended. Uh, and for those of you, if anyone is calling in through the phone, I do have a PowerPoint with visuals. I'll definitely try to illustrate things the best of my abilities so that you can still glean something from this program without actually seeing some of those visuals. All right, I think that's it. So we are going to spend the next little bit discussing the wild side of our state of Nevada, um, that side that awakes when night falls. So these animals all have really unique adaptations that help them survive and contribute their vital role in the ecosystem. And before we dig into it, we will make use of that chat box again, because I want to ask you what you think our world would look like if nocturnal animals did not exist. So nocturnal animals, these are nighttime active animals. So they spend their lives in the darkness. What do you think would change about our world or what do you think our world would look like if those animals were not around? There'd be more bugs and mice, yes. I agree. Lots of insects, mice, might have a serious rodent problem. Very good. 
Yeah, it upset the ecosystem. It'd be quiet at night. Some of us might appreciate that in some nights. <laughs> oh, it looked like Mars. Nice. <laughs> Yeah, you guys can keep the answers coming in. That's awesome. So I like the answer. It looked like Mars because that's exactly what was on my mind when I thought about the world without nocturnal animals. This is what I think living without nocturnal animals or wildlife in general would look like. So if you think about the ratio of daytime active and nighttime active animals, it's pretty much split right down the middle. And this allows our ecosystem to balance itself out and act cohesively with itself so that it can resume the things it needs to remain balanced. So think about bats, for example. I know you guys mentioned the insect problem we would have. Bats eat just about four tons of insects annually. That's a lot of insects. Or songbirds, a lot of songbirds migrate at night and they play that important role in seed dispersal and pollination. So they're important to our crops, they're important to our beautiful landscapes. Think about riding a bicycle with no wheels. It, it wouldn't happen. It's, it's essential that you have wheels on a bicycle. You can't take a vital component out of a system without completely altering how the rest of it functions. And that's essentially what roles each animal has in our ecosystem. So these are just some of the main questions I want to run over with all of you. Um, to start, who are they? So we're going to learn a little bit about who nocturnal animals are um, and why they're here. So some of those roles that they might play in our ecosystem. We're also gonna talk about what our impact is on these animals and some of the ways that we can help them too. And my favorite part, we are going to go over where we can find them or how we can find them too, so we can appreciate this awesome wildlife that we have in Nevada. So first, who are they? This is a pretty simple visual of the kind of definition of where nocturnal animals lie on the spectrum of time. So nocturnal animals, we have, they're circled right here. So they're active during those nighttime, those dark hours. Uh, contrary to that, we have what's called diurnal. So diurnal, like us, we are daytime active. So those are those animals that are active during the sunlit hours. There is a nice in-between to diurnal and nocturnal, and that's called crepuscular. The crepuscular animals are most active during the dawn and dusk hours. So that's when they spend their time actively foraging or hunting and spend that activity required for survival during those dawn and dusk hours. So animals don't always stay strictly within their term. So just like some of us might want to stay awake late into the hours of the night, some nocturnal animals can be seen intermittently throughout the day. Uh, other nocturnal animals will spend their whole day resting. So a, a fun fact with this too, so nocturnal does not only refer to animals, but there are also nocturnal plants too. And so those plants are those plants that are bloom, blooming or taking in their energy during those nighttime hours. So why are they nocturnal? We know they are, we know they're there at night, but there are some reasons that might benefit them to be active during those nighttime hours. So first, darkness offers great protection from predators. So it's just a natural way to stay out of sight. Uh, this also offers the same advantage to those predators so they can stealthily hunt for their prey without being seen. Um, especially in the southern Nevada area. So it gets really hot in the summertime, as some of you in the south here might know. We're approaching triple digits soon. Um, so a lot of animals want to come out at night because it's not as hot during the night. They want to conserve that heat and that conserve that water. So this is especially helpful during those warmer months, especially in the desert too. State of Nevada, we're a very arid state. So they wanna make sure that they're staying cooler so they can't hold on to that water that they do collect. And of course, by having this relatively 
equal balance of nighttime active and daytime active animals, there's just less competition for food overall. So if all animals were daytime active, it would, it would be pretty hectic. Uh, it would be a little wild to see. So we are going to spend the next little bit being the Little Red Riding Hood of nocturnal animals. We're going to go over some of the senses that they have and some of the senses that we can use to find them as well. Um, so these are senses that nocturnal animals might need to use to observe and survive in their surroundings and how the senses allow animals to survive in their environment as well. So I'm going to play a few sounds that some of you might hear right outside your home at night. I know we did use the chat a little bit to discuss some of those animals we've been seeing or hearing. So we're going to do a little guessing game here. So we're going to have the chat open and I am going to play each of these sounds and I want you guys to try to guess to see if you might be able to figure out what you are listening to. So we will start. Oh, I need it. Ooh. Sounds like y'all know what this one is. All right, let's go to the next one. job. I saw a great answer for each of those. So I will do the big reveal now and you can compare some of those answers that you had and see if you got most of them right. So here we are, that first one. It was an owl, great horned owl. We also saw some or heard some crickets, coyotes, raccoons, and a common poor will too. And um, I did try to throw the city traffic in there, but I think y'all were able to figure that one out. And the last one is a big brown bat, which we um, have an abundance in Nevada as well. So nice job. I do, um, I want to open a poll for you guys, because I know we were talking a little bit about um, some of these animals already that you all have been seeing in your backyard. So I will open up a poll because I'm curious to see um, if any of these are something more or less that you have been hearing in your yards. And I know these aren't all inclusive of some of the things you more commonly hear, but I do want to just get a comparison, kind of get a feel for what you've been listening to lately. And there is an other option for this as well. So the poll should have come up and you can just answer which of these nighttime sounds do you hear most often where you are? Coyotes, crickets, city traffic. I hear a lot of city traffic too. Someone else is hearing four wheels. I've been hearing them as well. Cool. And I have noticed some of y'all are raising your hand. We're not going to be able to respond to those inquiries. Um, if you do have any questions, though, you're absolutely more than welcome to put them in the question and answer box, and Jess is there to help you out with some of those. Cool. 
Cool. Ooh. These are some awesome votes. It looks like Coyotes is taking the win right now. I'll leave it up for just a couple more seconds uh, and then we will end it. All right, so I will share those results with you. It looks like coyotes have been uh, predominantly heard ones um, as of lately in y'all's neighborhoods. So cool. Thank you for participating in that. This is fun too, because it makes me feel like I'm not just talking to a computer screen that I actually have folks that I'm talking with too. So I really appreciate the participation. It helps a lot. <laughs> All right, next I want to show you in this, we're still on the sense of hearing. This is a really neat video. It was put together um, by BBC Studios and it essentially goes over the flight noise or the flight sound that is created from two diurnal birds and one nocturnal bird. So they, they use like this super sensitive sound monitoring equipment and they are able to pick up on the sound waves of Flight created the sound waves created by the flight of a um, pigeon, a peregrine falcon, and a barn owl. And I definitely encourage you to watch the whole video. We're just going to watch the first 30 seconds or so of it. But if you watch the whole thing, you can actually see how those frequencies are picked up and some of the variables that go into it. And it's really neat. But I will show a short clip of it because it's absolutely worth sharing. So I do um, want to run over why that barn owl was able to have silent flight like that as a nocturnal hunter. You can imagine it's important to be able to sneak up on their prey animals at night. It allows them to be super stealthy. Um, and one of those reasons that that silent flight is uh, available to them is because of the structure of their feathers. So this photo shows a close-up of the leading edge on a primary wing feather of a barn owl. So those, the leading edge is this part of their wing, that front part of the wing. And those um, primary wing feathers, those are the flight feathers, essentially the outer feathers that allow it to fly. So with a normal bird in flight, air will rush over the surface of the wing, it creates turbulence, and that makes sort of that gushing or whooshing sound that you might hear. So if you listen to ravens, if you hear a raven fly close by, you might hear that gush of noise go by you. Um, but with this owl's wing, because it has those small comb-like structures on the leading edge of its wing, it's actually able to break up that turbulence and break up that sound. So it effectively muffles it and allows this owl to fly silently. And you can actually experiment with this on your own. If you um, take a thin rope or you know, a fabric cord of some sort, and if you have one that's super, super smooth and you whip it, you'll hear that gushing noise. And then if you compare it to a rope that's really tattered, if you tatter it up a bunch so it looks super fuzzy and all of that, and you whip that one, you'll notice it's virtually silent. So it's, it's a pretty cool experiment if you ever want to try it. So those are some ways that we can or cannot hear them. But what are some ways that they might be able to hear us or hear others around? There's a lot of adaptations that these animals have to enhance their senses in one way or another so that they can survive in their nighttime environment. And many nocturnal neighbors of ours um, have large cupped ears like these foxes here. And that's just one feature that allows them to focus in and hone in on sounds around them. So if you think if you have a pet dog, you'll notice this too. With their, if they have upright ears, you'll notice if you make a noise or they hear a noise, they'll turn their ear in the direction of that noise so that they can kind of hone in on it. So you can see these foxes are able to do that too. And I want you to try something too. If you, so cup your hands, cup your hands like this and put them behind your ears. And now if you listen to your talking computer, you'll notice the sound might be a little bit more amplified. So you might be able to hear this a little bit better. Whereas if you turn your head and try to listen, you might notice that the sound isn't as directional 
So it's a really good way for these animals to be able to kind of hone in specific directions to listen to their surroundings. Uh, another way some animals can hear is through what's called asymmetrical hearing. So many owls uh, have asymmetrical hearing, which is essentially a way for them to hear their location of prey. So you'll see this, this great horned owl, their right ear is a little bit higher than their left ear. So their right ear here, and then their left ear here. And the reason they're asymmetrical like that is because it essentially allows them to detect which ear hears that sound first. And then they're almost able to triangulate the exact location of that animal because of the difference in time that it takes for that sound to hit one ear versus the other. So you can try this too. If you, so cup your hands again and have one like this, but then put the other one like this. And you'll probably notice that the sound coming from your computer is hitting one ear before it's hitting the other. And so that's essentially what we're doing is we're mimicking that asymmetrical hearing of having sound hit one ear before it hits the other to determine the direction that that sound is coming from. Um, you can see it pretty good on this skull here too. This is a boreal owl skull. Uh, we don't have these in Nevada, but they have a very large discrepancy between the um, height of one ear versus the other. So you'll notice pretty clearly the, um, the difference in their ear canals in the skull, which is really neat to see. One final um, form or another form of kind of hearing, it's called echolocation. And so you might have heard this term as it refers to the way that bats are able to hunt. Um, it's essentially a way for them to navigate objects around them. So like that sound we heard from bats, that really high pitched clicking noise, they do that because they are performing what's called echolocation. Essentially, those high frequency calls, they rebound off of objects and their really, really large ears are able to receive those collect reflected sounds that are rebounding off the objects. And the bats actually are able to turn these sound waves into essentially like a mental picture for them to determine exactly where that object is uh, and the reason that they do that fast pace clicking, because if it's an object like this fly that's moving, they need to continue to be able to track that sound. Um, and if you see on the right here, this is a Luna moth. So this is a very tasty treat for bats. Um, they have actually counter adapted to the echolocation of bats. So they have over time developed features that help them to be prey less often um, from bats. So they have this wing structure here. You notice it curls around like that in the bottom. And although it's very beautiful, it's actually um, less of an attractant for mates and more of a detractant for bats. So those curled tails actually help them to throw off the sounds emitted from bats so that they're not as effectively able to echolocate the location of the luna moth. So when the sound hits the bottom of the wings here, it essentially bounces it in various directions and throws them off. All right, so we have as little red riding hood moved on to the sense of smell. Um, think if you've ever smelled a nocturnal animal. If you think about your wildlife encounters, if you've ever come across a smell of a nocturnal animal or maybe just any animal. So you see on the right here, not, oh, I see a skunk someone commented. Yeah, <laughs> that's definitely a good one. Um, so mountain lions and a lot of mammals like bears, they use scent marking as a way to mark territory, as a way to find mates. Um, these smells are often very distinctive and they want them to be distinctive to get that point across whether it's territory or mates. Um, and I imagine most of us, if, or if any of us have lived or have ever lived in bear country, 
Um, you might have encountered that smell, or even if you have domestic cats at home, uh, they often exhibit these behaviors as well if they're trying to mark territory in some way or another. Um, there's a, another form of smell that some of us that might have found ourselves in um, other areas might have come across. So this image on the left here, um, I, we can use the chat for this because I'm curious if anyone knows what this is a picture of. And not the bugs, but what the bugs are on top of. And we can use the chat if any of you think you might have a guess or answer as to what this is. Um, if it helps, I will say that these bugs here, those are cave cockroaches. Ooh. I've seen a few people, yeah. Yeah, several folks have said bat guano. Very good. So bat guano, it's bat poop. That's essentially what you're looking at right here. Um, it's present, bat guano can be present in any cave system or dark covered areas where bat colonies reside. It's essentially the colonies droppings. Uh, and it can appear like this is a sticky brown paste. It often has a really strong smell of ammonia. So if you've ever been in a cave or an area where bats reside, you might have come across that really strong smell um, while observing the area. So the trained human nose, so there's some biologists that study bats, can actually, they can differentiate what kind of bats are around them based on their odor. So this isn't the guano, but the bats themselves all have different odors. And uh, it can vary based on the species of bats. So, for example, Mexican free-tailed bats, they produce a smell that's similar to corn tortilla, and that's because they have a compound, uh, it's called matza, and it's the same compound that's found in the uh, ingredients to create corn flours, and um, so like tortillas or anything that uses corn flour. And so a lot of folks think of the smell of Mexican free tails as relating to that because of that chemical similarity. Now, there's also evening bats uh, and they emit a smell of burnt oranges. Uh, so I've never noticed these smell differentiations in bats, but maybe I'm not spending enough time around bats. If I were a biologist that did a lot of that as a part of my job, it, it might be something that you would be able to train your nose to do. <laughs> So in the same way we may be able or may not be able to <laughs> detect bat species by smell, um, there are a lot of ways that they can use their sense of smell to help navigate their habitats. Um, so you can see this photo on the left, this is a bat colony. So if you just see how many bats there are in that photo, um, bats are actually able to, mother bats are able to detect um, individual bats so that they can hone in on their own pups. So if they have pups in a colony of what looks like thousands in this photo, they're actually able to mark their pups with scent glands so that they can keep track of their own individual pups so that they can provide that care to them. Um, other animals, you see a fox right over here and Many dog-like animals too, they have that extended snout. And so that bigger extended snout allows them to have an improved sense of smell. And what looks like the fox is doing here is um, hunting for prey. So foxes have really good senses of smell. They're actually able to often pick up on the scent of rodents that are underground. And so it could be that this fox is doing just that in that photo. Now there's also insects that have a sense of smell per se, um, without those same, you know, nose sense organs, but they have other sense organs and antennae that allow them to detect chemicals in the air using those sense organs. And this helps them to locate pollen of their favorite flowers too. So we are now on to the sense of sight. So this is a really cool sense that we can delve into and especially something that we can relate to because as humans we have very strong uh, a very strong sense of sight it's definitely one of our stronger senses typically 
So I want you to look at this photo here. Uh, and we can use the chat for this too. I want you to tell me if you see an animal in that photo. Uh, actually, there is an animal. I'll let you know that. I want you to tell me, you to tell me what kind of animal is in that photo. So see if you can find it first and then see if you can tell what kind of animal it might be. So that's this photo right here. Seeing a couple people say it, yeah. So if you look really closely, you can see it's beak right here, it's eye here. This is a common poor will. So it's a kind of bird and they do look very similar to owls or often mistaken for owls, but um, it is a nightjar, it's a nocturnal bird that spends a, a lot of time resting on the ground doing just this. Um, sometimes folks even uh, mistake them for being injured or ill because they are so still during the day like that and it can often look unusual compared to the behavior of the diurnal birds that we see. Um, but this is actually very normal behavior for poor wills. And normally they find a spot just like this so that you don't even notice that they're there. Uh, so camouflage is really important for these nocturnal animals because during that daytime, they do wanna rest because they wanna save their energy for nighttime. And so they don't wanna stick out like a sore thumb while they're sleeping or resting. They wanna make sure that they're able to blend into the habitat that they live in. So now if we take a look at the photo here on the right, um, you may recognize that eye shine is something you may have seen along the side of the road while you were driving or maybe on trails using a flashlight. Um, this eye shine is something that a lot of nocturnal animals have and it's uh, something that we as diurnal humans, we do not have this eye shine uh, that nocturnal animals have. It's actually a result of this special reflective layer that some nocturnal animals have. It's called the tupidum lucidum. Um, and this essentially enhances the amount of light absorbed by photoreceptors in the eyes and reflects it back. Um, so essentially they mix that light that they receive um, together and it allows the animal to produce sort of a brighter image of where the light source is coming from. So it kind of serves as their personal flashlight in a way, if that makes sense. Uh, and it essentially allows them to navigate and pick up on light sources that might be around them, whether it in nighttime or daytime environments. Um, what's really cool about the eye shine in animals is that you can sometimes differentiate uh, what kind of animal you're seeing based on the color of the eye shine. Uh, there are a lot of factors that go into the color of eye shine. Sometimes um, the health or age of the animal can play a role. Uh, sometimes the color, the actual color of the eyes can play a role in how that light is reflected or the light source. But oftentimes um, you can see a blue color, for example, emitted from domestic dogs. So if you have a pet dog, you can try it on them and see if you see that blue eye shine. Uh, animals like mountain lions and coyotes, you'll often see a yellow-green eye shine emitted from their eyes when they are reflecting that light. Or um, ringtail cats, uh, poor wills and rabbits, so like the poor will here, they often have red eye shine uh, as a result from their tupedum lucidum, lucidum layer. So pretty cool. So next time you do see some of that, uh, out, you know, seeing wildlife at night, see if you might be able to pick up on that color and determine what animal it might be from that. All right, this is a big diagram. We're not gonna dig into the details of it, but I just kind of want to illustrate some basics of vision uh, and how it differentiates between daytime active and nighttime active animals. I'm pretty visual and I know some other folks might be visual learners, so this might help kind of illustrate it a little bit. Essentially, we have uh, two components in our retinas. It's called rods and cones. 
And so rods perceive shades of light and dark and cones perceive color. So humans, we have a lot of cone cells. We have more cone cells than rod cells and therefore our color vision is great. So our daytime color vision is excellent, but during the nighttime hours, we don't have great night vision. And nocturnal animals, on the other hand, they typically have many, many more rods than cones in their eyes. And that's because they need to rely on those rods for their night vision. That's also why many nocturnal animals don't even see in color at all because they lack those cones that we have. So if you think about if you have been blinded by headlights from a vehicle or someone shown a flashlight or headlight into your, into your eyes and you get this like shock of color that kind of blinds you for a second, essentially what's happening is that bright, bright light is bleaching a chemical called rhodopsin. Rhodopsin is in the rods of your eyes. And that rhodopsin, when it's ble it gets bleached by this bright light, and it usually takes about 30 minutes to recover. And so when you are walking around at night, you are relying on your rods to see because your cones aren't active, because you can't use cones without the presence of light. So when someone shines a flashlight in, those rods that are trying to be super active get bleached out, and it actually destroys temporarily your night vision until that rhodopsin is able to recover. And that's why at night, um, it's a lot better to use warmer hues than uh, cooler hues. So if you have that stark blue or white light, blue and white light have a very short wavelength to them on the color spectrum. And so it can act much faster uh, in bleaching that rhodopsin. So it takes a very short amount of time for white or blue lights to bleach it, whereas red or orange lights, they have longer wavelengths. And so it actually takes longer to bleach the rhodopsin in your eye. Uh, the automobile industry picked up on this. If you'll notice, our vehicles all have red rear lights. Uh, that's so it doesn't blind people that are driving behind them at night. I do want to open a, another poll because I have a trivia question for you. We'll see if we can figure this out. Um, and it does have to do with the number of rods in owls. So I'm going to launch this poll. The humans, we have approximately, and this is approximate about 200,000 rod cells per square millimeter. So comparing that to a nocturnal owl, about how many rod cells per square millimeter do you think owls have? And I'll leave this up for just a minute. No Googling, you can't cheat. <laughs> Some good answers. It looks like about three quarters of us of us have answered so far. I'll wait just a little bit longer and then I'm gonna share the results with everyone. All right, 77 have submitted their answers. I'm gonna end the poll and I will share your results. So most of y'all thought that there are 1 million rod cells per, per square millimeter in an owl's eye, and you're correct. Uh, and that can vary based on uh, the species, but on average, that's about how many rod cells that they'll have, which is a lot more than us humans have. So good job, everyone. Cool. All right, so let's talk about ways that they can see us. If you think about their eyes, if you've seen nocturnal animals, we talked about their rods and cones, um, different factors that give them that excellent sight. 
Um, if you look at these two animals, we have a kangaroo rat and a ringtail cat. You can actually see that red eye shine a little bit in the ringtail cat, which is pretty neat. Um, but if you take a close look at their eyes and the size of their pupils, so then their eyes, you'll notice they're huge. Uh, and in comparison to our eyes, pupils in uh, nocturnal animals can usually dilate to the extremes and this allows them to have, it's called scotopic vision. It essentially involves just those rods um, to allow them to quickly dilate and constrict their pupils to respond to the lack or presence of light. Uh, and you'll notice this in our own eyes too, our own eyes do it as well. So if you go into the bright sunshine, our pupils are going to immediately get smaller because it doesn't want to let all of that strong light in. And if you're in a low light environment in the darkness, you'll notice our pupils get much larger because it can take in what little light there is available to us. There's uh, some differentiation in the shapes of pupils of different animals too. And this applies to diurnal and nocturnal animals, but it's uh, most useful as a feature for nocturnal animals in some of these. So that picture on the very left, that is, um, right here, that's a human eye, that's our eyes. Um, but you'll notice different shapes, whether it be horizontal or vertical or just smaller in general. Some of them have diagonal pupils as well. Um, the shapes of the pupils allow them to respond to different light levels in different ways. So when you have narrow pupils, like those horizontal and vertical pupils, they essentially act as like a sliding door. So they're able to get smaller really, really quickly when they need to, so that they can more quickly respond to an increase in light availability. Um, some cool stuff about slit pupils too, you'll notice there are some that have vertical and some that have horizontal, and that most typically uh, helps to differentiate whether you are looking at a predator or a prey animal. So we can use the chat for just a minute. I want you all to think about why one animal would want vertical pupils and one would want the more horizontal pupils. And think about their diets and whether they are a predator or prey animal. You'll notice here we have a predator with that vertical and a prey animal with that horizontal. Yeah, awesome job, y'all. Seeing some good responses here. Vertical sounds easier to hunt at night, nice. See the panoramic vision, yeah. So if you think about a vertical pupil as a predator, that helps you hone in and focus on something. Whereas as a prey animal, you want to be able to see your surroundings at all times because you want to look for that predator that might be around behind the bushes somewhere. So you want that horizontal pupil so you have more panoramic vision so you can, while you're foraging, you can always observe into your surroundings to understand what's around you. With that, uh, a lot of predators have eyes that are facing forward, so eyes on the fronts of their head to help them focus in on those things just like humans do. And a lot of prey animals, you'll notice, will have eyes on the sides of their head. And so that helps them to keep that panoramic vision uh, going when they're trying to survive in their environment. All right, so we are experts at how, or how nocturnal animals see and hear and smell and how we can see, hear, and smell them. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about why they're here. So, Let's use this chat again. I wanna hear some of the things that y'all think nocturnal animals contribute. So we talked about in the very start of the webinar, uh, what our world would look like without them. So what is it that they help the world with? So why are they here? Balance ecosystem, nice JC. Awesome. To see food, help balance the ecosystem. Keep down rodents and insects, pollination. 
Yeah. Oh, Katie says the ringtail cat eats all the mice. Mountain lions help keep the deer population in check. Yeah, these are great answers. And they all, yeah, they all tie back to just balancing that ecosystem. You know, every animal and plant has their own role to help our ecosystem function as a whole. Good job. And some of these, these ones on this slide, you've all already really hit the nail on it. These are exactly what you are saying. So pest control, we wanna make sure that some of those larger animals are eating some of those smaller animals, vice versa. We wanna make sure that that ecosystem is in check. Pollination, it's important, especially since we do have some nocturnal plants. We want those nocturnal pollinators to help keep those moving along. And of course, diversity too. We wanna make sure that our ecosystem remains diverse so that it can function how it is. So think about if a, what would happen to a rabbit population if coyotes disappeared? Or if there is no bat guano in the caves? So bat guano, it may be poop to us, but to those cave crickets, that's an essential nutrient. That's their food source. It also serves as actually a really good fertilizer for plants too. Uh, and moths, they complement the work of bees. So they can carry pollen over greater distances. They don't have to tie to a particular part of the landscape either. So they really contribute to helping us pollinate some of our crops and other plants within our landscapes. All right, so let's talk a little bit about our impact now. So, we know that they're important to us, and how does human activity affect that? So of course we know we might have shifted the behavior, or actions might have shifted the way our ecosystem works in some way or another. Um, we've actually, in some um, urban environments, animals like coyotes, they have actually switched to nocturnality. Uh, so coyotes are naturally diurnal or crepuscular, but in urban environments, you'll actually see that they exhibit more nocturnal behavior because they do want to stay uh, away from that human activity that they see in those urban environments. And so when that happens, I mean, again, it has a change or it has a ripple effect on the ecosystem. So if you think these animals that normally hunt diurnal prey are now hunting nocturnal prey, how does that throw things off? You know, it's, it's small things, but it can have a ripple effect on how the rest of the ecosystem is affected. So we'll go over these senses again, but this time uh, I wanna compare some of those natural senses with some of those human-made um, effects on those senses. So we're back to being Little Red Riding Hood again, um, thinking about hearing. So there's a big difference between sound and noise. Um, simply put, sound, is um, what happens in nature. So it's things we hear that happen in nature. And noise are human-made uh, productions of, of sound. So noise is thing, things like construction, like in this photo, um, things that are produced by humans. So if you've ever avoided an area because it was really loud and annoying, like say you're going for a walk and you hear construction, you go in the other direction. So animals, animals do that too. You know, they, they rely on these sense of hearing to do things like finding food, finding mates. So if they have a bunch of noise getting in the way of that, it might negatively affect how they're able to hunt or find, find mates. And think about the hearing ability of bats and owls. So they rely on that hearing to hunt. So if a bat is using echolocation and there's a bunch of noise getting in the way of the sounds that it's producing, it can greatly affect its ability to find that prey. We also have smells that can interact and affect the way that uh, animals are able to survive. So air pollution, this can muddle flower scents, making it more difficult for that luna moth to be able to find its blooms. So insects will often, they have very particular flowers, uh, usually based on their mouth parts that they're able to pollinate. And so they'll search for specific scent mixtures to um, find those flowers. And if those scent mixtures are off because there's other smells in the air, that can affect their ability to recognize the flowers that they're in search of. 
And uh, probably the most relevant human-induced conflict on the lives of nocturnal animals is light pollution. Uh, some of you might recognize this place here. Um, light pollution can have a lot of different effects on nocturnal animals. Uh, to start it, it changes circadian behavior in animals. So circadian rhythm, it's, um, it's essentially an internal clock that tells us when to wake up and when to sleep. And it's based on the rotation of the sun and those light and dark hours. So it's something that's innate to us. It's something that's innate to a lot of mammals to have that circadian rhythm in order to navigate their activity times. And so this is just something that's biologically programmed in us. Um, there's birds that hunt at night. So they navigate by moonlight and starlight, and if they're seeing artificial light, it might confuse and throw them off. So they might travel toward that urban environment that they see all of the light in, and then they have to worry about buildings um, obstructing their flight. Or they might choose to, you know, wander off course because of that, or they might even migrate too early or too late and miss ideal climate conditions for nesting or foraging or mating just because that circadian rhythm again is thrown off. And um, insects, as we may know, if we have porch lights outside of our homes, they are very drawn to artificial light. And this can be a fatal attraction for, um, for them because we know predators pick up on that as well, and predators seek out those insects that surround that light source. You'll actually notice uh, if you go to Las Vegas, this is where the Luxor light is, and if you view that at night, you can oftentimes see like colonies of bats surrounding this light because all of the insects are getting drawn to the light, and so it's bringing those bats in, and it's great for the bats, but again, we have to think about that balance of the ecosystem and how is that affecting other areas of our food web. This is a, a NASA satellite imagery. It's a really neat depiction of what our globe looks like as it's seen at night. And so you can see all of these lit up areas. That is all the artificial light that was photographed during a time lapse of the nighttime environment of all of these areas. We zoom in. This is the United States. Um, I want you to take a look at this too and see if you can, based on the light, determine where some of those you know, major cities are. So where is New York City? Maybe you can find Chicago. Maybe you can find Los Angeles. Maybe you can find where you live right now too. Just based on these artificial lights, it almost creates a pattern to determine these different ge geological locations. So geographical. Um, zoomed in here, you can see you might recognize this place, our state of Nevada. So take a minute to look at this and see if you can find where you live in this picture. So use that light again to determine if you can find where your home is. I'll give you some help here too. Um, so you may have seen this bright light down here showing Las Vegas. And if you live near the Reno area, seeing that, you can also notice um, light patterns that follow along major highways too. So if I go back to this, you can actually see exactly where those highways move based on the light sources that surround them too. Um, something else I marked up here, if you look right up here, there's a red dot up there. Uh, that marks the Massacre Rim Study Area. So this is an area that was actually designated as a dark sky sanctuary by the International Dark Sky Association. And this is one of only eight places in the world that have this designation. I'm gonna zoom out again, just to show you why it might have that designation. So that red dot is still there. And look at some of those sources of light pollution and other areas in our country compared to right there. 
So you can see it's definitely barren of some of that artificial light that other areas have. And we'll say, I know we have, you know, we have light pollution, we have urban environments in our state that creates light pollution, but we are also really, really lucky to live in a place that has such beautiful dark skies in places like Massacre Rim. There's a lot of places that we can view in our state to really get some of those dark sky environments and possibly the opportunity to view some of those nocturnal animals that come with it too. So ways that we can help in this regard, um, in the regard of light pollution, there are definitely some things that we can do to help these animals navigate their survival techniques while they're uh, navigating the nighttime environment. So we may not be able to turn the Luxar light off, but there are things that we can do in our own home. Just very simple things, not using light when we're not needing it. Um, if you do have light on in your house, you can turn your blinds down at night so it doesn't obscure the outside environment. We're outside using shielded downward facing light. This not only helps that night sky up here, but that also helps us too with downward facing light. We get the strength of that light focusing on the area that we need to see in. And so by having downward facing light like this, we're actually getting more light where we need it instead of just letting it all float up into the sky. Uh, and with that, just like we discussed with the rhodopsin in our eyes and in nocturnal animals' eyes, using warm colored lights, so reds and yellow light hues, instead of the cool blue and white hues that might bleach that rhodopsin a little bit more readily. These are just some things that we can do. And it helps us too. And so when we reduce some of these artificial light sources, it helps us to improve our circadian rhythm. So we need physiological nighttime. It's part of our biology to stay in sync and stay healthy. Um, there's a hormone, it's called melatonin, you may have heard of. This is something, it begins rising around sundown. I think it peaks around midnight, typically. It's something that's produced naturally in our body in response to our nighttime environment. And this has a cascade of reactions. It helps our sleep-wake cycle, so it helps us kind of keep uh, temporal cycles from waking and sleeping. It helps to lower our body temperature at night and slow our metabolism. It also uh, decreases our appetite as well. So artificial light can interfere with this chemical combination and process and it can actually delay and um, yeah delay the production of melatonin. So we definitely want to try to limit that in our own lives just so that we can keep our sort of biological process running smoothly as well. And of course, just to see the stars too. So reducing artificial light helps us to see that beautiful landscape around us. Uh, if you see this photo on the screen here, on the right here, you'll notice it's the same house, but on the right, this is showing a photo taken just after that neighborhood had experienced a blackout. And so all the houses in the neighborhood uh, lost their artificial light sources. And then the photo on the le left is showing how the house after the blackout had recovered and the neighborhood was able to return to using their lights. And just look at the dramatic difference in the night sky they're able to see in one versus the other. All right. So my favorite part is where can we find them? Um, we're definitely experts on nocturnal animals now. We know all their senses and how to use our senses to see, hear, smell them. Uh, and this is just a short and brief description of some of the places that we might be able to see these animals in our very own state. So these are areas that are known for beautiful dark night skies. And with that, that means that there's less of a human influence to affect the behavior of nocturnal animals. So we can see some of that natural nocturnal uh, habitats. So if you ever come across uh, nocturnal animals, these are great places to start that. Um, but I will say that even, especially now during these times, I mean, even seeing these animals in our backyard easy to observe them just right from our own homes. 
It's just knowing what to listen for and being patient and understanding that these nocturnal animals love this foam just as much as we do. And we can appreciate them and observe them right from our own backyards. There are a few tips for observation. Uh, of course, again, just quietly observing and listening. Uh, using that red light to minimize damage to night vision, it helps preserve our own night vision so we can see these things at night. Uh, it's also a fun trick. If you use a black light, you can discover scorpions. So they have proteins in their exoskeleton that reacts with black lights and it essentially and their exoskeleton essentially emits that blue glowy hue that you see. So if you shine a flashlight on the ground of the desert, you might be able to see some blue glowing scorpions, which is fun. All right, at this point, um, I do want to open up this forum to some questions that may not have been answered yet. Um, I Hope that you all were able to enjoy this program and I will open up a Q&A or Jess if you want to hop on your audio too if you have any that you've noticed that you haven't gotten to answer yet and if any of you do want to type some more answers we can answer some of those live for you now too. It looks like there's no open questions in the Q&A now. I'll give it a little bit though if you guys do have some more. Um, and while you're coming up with some of those, I do just want to say thank you to everyone. Uh, thank you for being a supporter of our wildlife and thank you for staying home for Nevada right now. It's really important that we're all in this together. Um, so I appreciate you coming and joining us in the virtual platform of programming. Uh, it's, it's been really exciting to continue to teach and learn about Nevada's wildlife from home. Uh, we do have a survey if you want to fill it out. It's just a few seconds and uh, this just helps us to continue to improve these programs and kind of glean your interest to see where we should take some of these programs too if you have specific areas of interest. Uh, we do have some upcoming webinars too. We have um, tomorrow, Friday, and Saturday, so in the next three days, if you really want to get to know us some more, uh, we'll be learning about sagebrush, uh, steppe ecosystems, cats of Nevada, and also uh, part of a series for uh, virtual hunter education as well. And I'll remain on if you guys do have any other questions. I'm happy to stick around a few minutes, so I do see some are coming in. Um, our rabbits nocturnal. That is a really good question. So rabbits are normally crepuscular. Uh, so that means that they're active during the daytime and nighttime hours. And the reason they uh, prefer to that crepuscular behavior is because sometimes our eyesight or animals' eyesights are a little bit more limited as they're adjusting between their night and daytime vision. Uh, so that allows them as the ultimate prey animals to kind of remain hidden when they need to be. Um, notice small scat with a little fur in it periodically in our yard. We're a block away from the fossil beds. Any ideas of what it might be? So that's a great question. It's, it's really hard to say without seeing a photo of it. If you do want to take a photo of the scat, uh, my contact information is up on the slide and I can help you ID it. I mean, if, if it's got fur in it, it's likely a predator animal. Um, so animals that have fur in their scat, that could be uh, foxes, so maybe fit foxes if you have those around the area. If you're talking about Thule Springs, they definitely exist in our lower desert here. That could be one option, but there's, there's a lot of different animals that you might see that have fur in them, and it, it depends on their diet for the time of year, too. Coyotes can have fur in their scat as well. Um, what can we do in our yards to help nocturnal animals live or visit us? That's a great question. So there's a lot of things you can do. Um, some folks in Nevada have installed bat houses or owl houses, and that's something that you can absolutely do to encourage some of those nocturnal animals um, so that you can observe them around you. 
And I will say just generally having a habitat that attracts those animals. So if you live in a really urban environment, you might be able to see those bats or owls by installing some of those houses, some of those uh, places for them to live. If you're in a more rural area, you might just naturally come across some of those nocturnal animals too. Are there scorpions near Tahoe? Yeah, there's scorpions found throughout Nevada. I would say they're more common in the Mojave Desert, though uh, they do kind of prefer that drier, arid environment. So you'll see more of them uh, down in the southern Nevada area. We do also have quite a big population down in like the Reno area. I've yeah, found great. my fair share. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, we have some Reno input here too. Thanks, Jess. <laughs> Awesome. Um, what kind of trees do owls nest in? So it can depend. They definitely prefer high roosting areas. It depends on the owls too. Um, owls uh, don't actually build their own nests, so they'll find already existing crevices or holes in trees. Uh, barn owls are so named because they often will actually nest in barns because they have those um, roofs or crevices that they're able to nest in. Uh, and then contrary to all of that, burrowing owls actually nest in the ground too, which is the only owl that does that. Are there any natural predators of coyotes? Uh, and if not, are they causing problems? So coyotes are, they're pretty large animals. There are predators that will definitely hunt for coyotes. So bigger mammals, mountain lions would be something that would prey on a coyote or um, birds of prey if the coyote is ill and slow moving. Uh, I will say, if you're asking, if not, are they causing problems? If you're referring to their population of coyotes, I mean, they're, they're definitely opportunistic animals. So they take advantage of all sorts of resources. They're really able to survive well in pretty much any habitat or environment they're handed to. But just a general balance and maintenance of the ecosystem kind of helps to keep that in check too. When are bears most active? I would say they're naturally crepuscular, but when you find bears in urban areas, you might see more nocturnal behavior. Just you might, you have live more in a bear country right now, but I would say diurnal and crepuscular normally, and then maybe nocturnal in the more urban environments. Yeah, you, um, you're totally right. So typically what we notice is bears can be active kind of any time during the day. However, when they do get closer to urban environments, they are a lot more nocturnal because they're trying to avoid us. Um, and they're super, super smart. So they'll, they'll do whatever they can to kind of avoid humans and get into our garbage, which we don't want. Yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, then Matthew asked, with the stay at home in effect, has Endow noticed more nocturnal animal activity? That's a great question. Um, I would say just from my personal uh, endeavors, I have noticed more animal activity. I know in Las Vegas just a couple of weeks ago, it was observed that there was a coyote walking up and down the strip um, in Las Vegas, an area that is normally completely populated by humans. Uh, and this is because, yeah, humans are not outside anymore. So we are kind of staying home. I went on a hike and saw a reptile, a rattlesnake, and a bunch of rabbits all at once. Um, kind of an unusual occurrence in the short amount of time that I was walking around outside and that could have been due to, you know, less crowds out and about in areas as well. Oh, where are ringtail cats found? So ringtail cats are found in southern Nevada. Um, I have seen them in Red Rock before. They'll occupy a lot of different habitats. Um, they definitely prefer those arid desert environments. So you'll see them, their kind of home bases are in branches of trees. Uh, you'll notice that's actually why they have that ring tail. It's um, to essentially help them camouflage in vegetation in trees where they uh, spend a lot of their time. But they do come out just at nighttime. So I would say they're not very often seen uh, in our area, but they are a cool site when you are able to see them. 
And then are there links to animal webcams in Nevada that we can watch? I don't believe there are any um, publicly broadcasted webcams that we have, at least from NDAO, unless just if I'm wrong and you have more information at that. So I am not aware of any currently that we have. Uh, yeah, I don't believe that we have any that we actively broadcast or anything like that. Uh, you might want to look at the Desert Research Institute. Sometimes they do a webcam um, situation. Cool. Um, are bobcats considered nocturnal or crepuscular? Uh, mostly nocturnal. So again, like this, this behavior can kind of vary based on season or food availability, but for the most part, you'll find that a lot of cats are nocturnal. And then any tips to see foxes? Ooh, that's hard. Um, they, I mean, a lot of animals are really good at spotting us before we spot them. Uh, <laughs> and when they spot us, they normally hide out somewhere. So I would say patience is your best way to see a fox. You know, go out into um, less urban, more rural environments um, and kind of go to where their natural habitats are and just sit and quietly observe and you might be able to get that very lucky opportunity to see some of those foxes. So especially areas where rabbits and rodents are. So that's their primary food source. So I'm sure you can find them looking for that in some of those areas. All right, I am going to close the Q&A now because uh, I know we're running a little bit over at this point. But again, I do want to thank you all for joining me for this webinar and thank you just for your help with it. Um, and if you do have any follow-up questions or suggestions, information, please feel free to use that contact information that's um, right at the bottom of your screen here. Uh, it shows my email and phone number, so feel free to reach out to me if you have any other inquiries. All right, thank you all so much, uh, and I hope to see you again soon.